everyone, this is Ryan, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the venous drainage system of the brain, face, and neck, and how that relates to cavernous sinus thrombosis. So just to get oriented, this is sort of a lateral view uh, of the left side of the face, and we start here from the superior vena cava, which is branching into the brachiocephalic, um, and here we have the internal jugular vein, uh, and this is just sort of a little break to show that the internal jugular vein continues up. And uh, we have the subclavian and also the external jugular vein uh, over here. One thing I thought was kind of tricky was figuring out where exactly the retromandibular vein is. And I think the best way to look at it is that this external jugular vein branches into the posterior auricular going up the side of the, of the face towards the ear and the posterior division of the retromandibular vein. And then this whole chunk of the retromandibular is considered the anterior division of the retromandibular vein. If you follow that down, we have a second junction point where it meets the facial vein to form the common facial vein which then drains into the internal jugular vein. And then the anterior jugular vein goes to an, another branch point up to the superficial temporal and then this maxillary vein which quickly joins the pterygoid plexus which is located at the side of the face near the jaw joint. And we have an emissary vein here which is simply connecting the plexus to the cavernous sinus and we have uh, this little vein is a deep facial vein connecting the pterygoid plexus to the facial vein which is coming up the side of the face and then when it gets close to the orbit it becomes the angular vein and then it becomes the superior ophthalmic vein which also drains into the cavernous sinus. So if you remember cavernous sinus is in a, a very bad disease that can cause uh, extraocular muscle paralysis and other conditions. And there are sort of three main routes to infecting that space. And the first one we sort of talked about is if you had a facial infection, Dr. Levitch mentioned if you were picking a pimple and somehow bacteria leaked into your venous drainage system, it would probably get into the facial vein or the angular vein and it would follow this path up, go through the ophthalmic vein, and reach the cavernous sinus. Now if you had a dental infection and you had bacteria le leaking into uh, the superior inferior alveolar veins which feed the pulp cavities, those would leak eventually into the pterygoid plexus and then it could take any number of paths to get to the cavernous sinus. And the third most a complex path would be through the scalp. So she mentioned that the um, scalp has three, has five layers, the skin, the connective tissue, aponeuroses of the occipital frontalis muscle, loose connective tissue, and then periosteum of the bone of the skull. So there are scalp veins in this C layer, and then more importantly there are these emissary veins in the loose connective tissue layer, which is referred to as the danger space, because this is where the bacteria and viruses, any microbes, can most easily get to. And once they're in that space, they can travel through the emissary veins into the diploic veins, which go through the P layer and the skull itself. Uh, and if th that s the cancellous portion of the skull bone is, is referred to as the diplo, that's where this gets its name, diploic, and it will eventually reach the superior sagittal sinus. Once it's here, it can take any number of paths to get to the cavernous sinus. It could probably go through the uh, occipital sinus around the foramen magnum and then go up the basilar sinus and get to the cavernous sinus. There are a ton of different paths it could take. And the reason why this can happen is because all of these veins, the emissary, diploic, they, they don't have valves. So blood, 
microbes can travel in any direction. Now once this cavernous sinus is infected, there it's a unique structure because there are a lot of different things running through it, including the internal carotid, and more, most importantly, the cranial nerves 3, 4, 5, 1, 5, 2, and 6. And any of those nerves could be infected, which would lead to extraocular paralysis. I hope this video is helpful, and I'll see you next time.